wholeheartedly agree with your uh, last recommendation regarding getting the right people in some of these positions. Okay, we're going to have an opportunity for two questions. <laughs> so if you can step up to a microphone. Okay, go ahead, sir. And, yeah, and um, let's, I'll only allow questions. Go ahead. Uh, um, thanks, uh, David Mendikoff, your I, I mean, I do want to just say very quickly that, that this panel's very useful in that I think there's a lot of intersections um, that lead for lead for potential optimistic um, ideas. And, and I actually, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to what you say later, Dahlia, because I, I, I just, I won't say it because you asked first this question, but I have some very good ways, I think, that, that okay. a lot of what people said could be synthesized very, very well. So, but I won't do that. Um, so I guess the question is, can some of the things that you're arguing, I mean, ways to change the US narrative from uh, national security, and I think it's important to really think about security, national security, to human security, or um, Arab pro-democratization to you know, recognize the power of Islamist parties. Can those types of um, interventions happen in some interconnected way? I mean, in other words, you know, are ways that we might think about addressing um, the problems of, of pro-democratic work in the US and pro-democratic work in um, the Arab world, are there ways that those might intersect? Okay. Um, okay. And can that happen without Israeli politics changing fundamentally? Thanks. Who wants to take that one? Da, da, I think Dahlia is going to go for it. That sounds like a question for you. Well, I mean, I, I already spoke for a bit. Anyone want to just, yeah. So I, I think Tamara mentioned this. And, you know, can the national interest protect human interest? And is it in the U.S. strategic interest to understand what it means to protect human interest? What we've mm. learned from the Arab Spring is that the human dignity of individuals, when it's repressed, is not in any strategic interest of the United States in terms of regional stability. Stability and democracy are very clearly today not two sides of the same coin. The more repression, the more long-term instability. We know what the prisons of the 50s and 60s gave us. Hmm. We know what the withdrawal of uh, US and Afghanistan is going to give us potentially. We know what's, you know, uh, I mean, let's not talk about Mosul. We're ignoring what's happening in Mosul or having, happening in Afghanistan. That the, the US footprint of not protecting the sanctity of, of individuals is also in our, in our um, security. So when we think about the national interest, can that be redefined to actually take human security seriously? And I think if it does, then it can e extend to all of the aspirations of individuals. We have been hedging our foreign policy in terms of long-term interest for short-term goals. And if we truly believe in democratic peace theory, then we need to actually question why that's the case. And just a quick thing to add. Part of the problem, though, I think is that senior U.S. officials, at least um, Democrats, I think they are aware of a lot of the long-term arguments. So that when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, they'll acknowledge, yeah, sure, you're right. And in the long run, it would be better to have democracies and that will be more conducive to stability. But the problem is they have short-term, they have short-term priorities and that's how, that's how they orient themselves in terms of what they do every day and quite honestly, they're a little bit lazy. They don't want to do like the heavy, like it, it takes a lot of work to reorient US policy in the Middle East. And they're asking themselves, why should I put in all of this work when I'll probably get shot down by like President <coughs> Biden or Brett McGurk? And there's basically just two, there's really, really two or three people who run Middle East policy now and, and make all the final, final decisions, Brett McGurk, Jake Sullivan, and President Biden. So I think there is also an incentive structure problem here that the intellectual arguments are compelling, but it seems so overwhelming and so difficult that people say, well, I'm just not gonna really get into it. I'm gonna accept the way things are. And I think that's gonna be one of the key challenges is how do you convince people to really put themselves on the line internally in the bureaucracy to push for different outcomes? Okay. Can I just add something quickly to that? Um, I, I'm not sure if this addresses your question, 
uh, but the way I read your question reminds me of the theme of um, nationalism in the Middle East, independent nationalism, whether it's secular or religious. And that's the core problem for US foreign policy. The reason why Mossadegh and Nasser were considered to be pariah figures, even though they were Islamists at all, is because they were challenging Western interests in the region. So they had to be opposed. And then in the trans transition to the late 20th century, when Islamist politics becomes mainstream, the, th that's the big problem. I mean, and that's, that's what it boils down to. And then on that issue, there's going to be fundamental uh, issues of conflict and, and tension, one of them being uh, the question of Israel. Independent nationalists within the region, whether they're secular or religious, want justice for the Palestinians. The United States is not willing to push or pressure Israel. Now, Shadi came up with an interesting formula here where you know, the United States could theoretically still support movements for democracy, but then lay uh, a red line uh, saying that if you know you want Western support, American support, you're going to have to make some sort of accommodation with Israel. I guess the question would be on what terms? Uh, which Israel are we talking about? Mm. Um, um, but I think that's really what's at the core of this particular issue, as I understand it. No, thank you for that. Um, okay, another question. I'll turn here, and then I'll come back to you, Professor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my question is about Kurds uh, who have been um, systematically denied rights for nearly a century, and they are a distinct ethnic and politically organized population, large spread across countries, namely uh, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, as we all know. And, all, and so it's a story with all immediate parties being Muslim majority actors. And given their aspirations, uh, given the Kurdish aspirations and mobilization, their story, how it unveils, will have serious implications for the region. So my question to the panel is, you know, how these cycles of uh, denial of rights should should be responded to, and uh, and what do you, how, how do you project it into the future? The story of Kurds, and and uh, what it's going to mean for the rest of the region. Thank you. Th thank you so much for that. Anyone the panel would like to uh, address that? Well, I'll, I'll offer a few comments very quickly. Um, the tragedy of the Kurds is that they're broken up between at least four states in the Middle East. And so any prospect of independent Kurdish state, which I support, would have to deal with that fundamental problem. And there's no situation on the horizon where I can see any of those states willing to give up territory to create an independent Kurdish state. The best that one can hope for, and we've seen examples of this, not in terms of an ideal type, but some movement, is when um, uh, countries that have a Kurdish population undergo some measure of partial democratization, which guarantees the Kurds greater autonomy, rights, and representation. So during the early phase of the Erdogan period, there was some movement in that direction. It shifted when it wasn't convenient anymore for um, uh, Erdogan to move in that direction. But there seemed to be, that was a reflection of, you know, uh, a commitment to greater democracy and rights. And it had a ripple effect in terms of allowing the Kurds in, in Turkey to assert themselves. The same in post-Saddam Iraq, when that authoritarian model was uh, taken down or it was removed, Kurds in the north expanded and benefited from that new political arrangement. That's that's the only model I see realistically, is that the greater there's democratization in countries that have a Kurdish population, the more there'll be a demand for autonomy, representation, allowing Kurds to, rep to have, you know, uh, teach Kurdish language and be able to be so, somewhat like, I guess, you know, I come from Canada, like the Quebecois in Canada, right? It's, they're part of Canada, but they have substantial autonomy to sort of represent their, their values and their identity, uh, but within the context of an existing democratic state. Yeah. No, I thought that was very good, actually. I, um, I would just recommend Amy Austin Holmes' latest book on statelessness mm -hmm. and how she saw an example of um, kind of a democratic space of Kurds and, and that powerful impact. It's a great book. And okay, Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, this was a great panel. My question is, for Dr. Fahmi, but others are welcome to uh, join in. Uh, so I think one reason for uh, the public's indifference to military coups in Egypt and Tunisia and even uh, uh, tacit support to coups is related to lack of economic development following the revolution in both countries, stagnation 
and uh, continuing unemployment. And this is not surprising in the sense that uh, countries experiencing transitions do not, usually do not have uh, high levels of economic growth. But my question is, is there specific properties of Islamist parties that when they come to power, right, that cause uh, uh, underperformance in economy? This could relate to their organization structure, their relations with administration, or perhaps, uh, Mr. Hamid describes in his book, uh, uh, deals with World Bank that were not implemented on time under Morsi government. So my question is, hmm. when Islamists come to power, are there specific endogenous dynamics associated with them that lead these countries to underperform economically? Thank you. The first part of your question again was? So just one question, which is, are the Islamists bad on economies when they come to power? Thank you. <laughs> so so if, if we look at the experiment in Egypt, it was 10 months long. And if we look at all of the indicators both internally within the Brotherhood power structure and in its internal failings, as well as external forces, for example, the fact that Petro didn't exist, but then all of a sudden it came back to flow, or the power of the UAE in bolstering certain parts of the economy as at the expense of others, or the power of the UAE in manipulating the media, right, and the perception of the economy, as well as what Shadi documents in his work. And so when we think about it, we can't draw these big measures about Islamists in power when our experiment is 10, is, is our end is 10 months long of, of one party. And so I don't think we can look at, say, yes, the internal dynamic structures and the authoritarianism within the Brotherhood led to failure on the economic level. I don't think we can say that. I think that there are fundamental internal failures, but I don't think we can extrapolate that onto the economy as, as blanketly as it might sound. I mean, also people's perceptions of the economy are notoriously unreliable. So was the economy bad under Morsi? Yeah, kind of, but it was people's perceptions of the economy that were, I think, more relevant here because according to most like objective metrics, the economy then was better than it is now. Um, on any, like, inflation being the most obvious metric, I mean, Egypt's now like an economic basket case of like an incredible level. Um, but people, but, so I think there's, there's, this, there's this issue of how, people will perceive the economy as being worse if they're unhappy about other things or if they think that the Muslim Brotherhood is a profound threat to the identity of the nation, that's going to bleed into how they perceive the economy. So I think we have to be very careful about just saying the economy is worse under transitions or under Islamist parties. Hmm. So, so three quick points. Um, when you study the main texts of political Islamists throughout the 20th century, you'll see that any discussion of economic theory is not the longest chapter in the books, right? Because they're about identity movements, and they're about resisting imperialism, and, and, and it's struggling for self-determination away from dictators. That's point number one. Second of all, uh, push back on, on, on your suggestion. The first decade of Erdogan's rule in Turkey, the economy was booming. And it went down. In fact, that's actually an argument to say that you know, the more there's democracy and democratic sort of opportunities, then that's good for the economic growth of the country. When things moved in, you know, post Gezi Park in the opposite direction, the economy tanked. Um, and lastly, I would uh, offer the point that look, the economic situation in many of these developing countries around the world, particularly in the Arab and Islamic world, are so immensely challenging, given the massive population explosion, the level of corruption, the absence of accountability that any government that comes into power um, of any political orientation is not going to be able to solve these challenges overnight because the problems are so immense and deep-rooted, uh, largely because of, I would argue, the, the persistence of authoritarianism, the absence of accountability. Of course, the Gulf states are different, right? But generally speaking, the non-Gulf states. So, I mean, that's just a fundamental you know, fact of, of the reality of developing societies everywhere, including in the Arab world. Um, there's no quick and easy fixes to the economic conditions of their citizens. I remember the first part of your question is about military coups. Military coups, yeah. Support, support for coups and military coups that remove democratically elected leaders do not lead to better democracies and better economies. And that's just what we've seen in, you know, none of these countries are immune to the laws of political science. 
And so if we think about the kind of trends of coups, coups that remove democratically elected leaders do not lead to greater opening or greater economies. Uh, I think last question. Thank you. So uh, my question is to Professor Son and Ishadi. So Professor Son talked about the work you know, of past 20, 30 years, you know, showing how Islam and democracy were compatible. But this was mostly theoretical in nature. And uh, whenever they, you know, the, this literature looked to real you know, world examples of success, it eventually failed. You know, in the Arab winter, Noah Feldman talks about Tunisia as a success case story just before the coup, right? And he says it, it might work because it worked somewhere. You know, it's not all failure. Well, it, it's no longer. Turkey was this early, you know, basically star of this literature, miserably failed. And also it's an Islamist government, you know, two Islamist governments in power, you know, popularly elected Hamas and Turkey, Turkey's Erdogan AKP really miserable, right? So there is no single example. Why should we be hopeful today that you know this work was successful? And I looked this through at this room. I have been coming to these conferences a lot since 2014. It used to be a full house. And you know, not only just people who are interested in democracy, but also from security intelligence circles, they were interested in you know, Islam as a threat or maybe opportunity, whatever. Even they are not in here. And I go to other events, it's not just CSID, it's Middle East Institute, others, nobody is there. So people are not even interested overall. So do you see all this work as a success? And also the elephant in the room. Uh, Turkey doesn't have any this is issue of you know the Israel as an elephant, you know. So, but still, it's very autocratic. You know, how do you explain this elephant in the room? Because like, and it's Islamists in power, and Turkey is the first country which recognizes Israel. It doesn't have the same kind of you know Arab you know immediate neighborhood you know issue. So, thank you. But wait, Said, um, which one was the elephant in the room of all those elephants that you just talked about? <laughs> I'm not even sure I can answer that question either, but I do want to comment on you're you're quite right that um, attendance is low. And year after year after year, we've had these meetings and attendance is low. Maybe you're noticing it is a little bit lower now. I'm not sure that's even true. It's always been low. And, and we always wondered, why? Why aren't these, rather than always wanted, you know, we need to get people from policy positions, policy making positions and get them to hear this because that's the naivety I'm talking about. We used to think, well, if they just understood things better, then they would know that we should be, uh, policy should be supporting these pro-democracy movements, whether they call themselves Islamist or not. But what my point was, is that policy people aren't trained to care about things like that. First of all, they do need to keep their jobs. If they go outside the party line, they won't be promoted. They probably will be dismissed. There's no question, of, there's no question about that. Their positions depend upon following the party line. It's structural. It's institutional. The ones who get hired are the ones who have been churned out of these programs that, that teach them to use this jargon, to use this language that normal people don't even understand because it's euphemistic, such as national interest. Nobody knows what that means, except if you've been in XYZ professor's class and know that that's a euphemism for making sure that you do exactly what your boss in the State Department tells you or you're going to be fired. Um, okay, so you should have him on your podcast. Yeah, right. Um, look, I think Tunisia did work until it didn't. So, I mean, that was a somewhat long experience. I mean, relative to the rest of the region, um, it turned out the way it did for a complex set of reasons. I think, I think it is worth asking why so many Tunisians weren't willing to fight for their democracy. That's where maybe mm. I would. I mean, that's a, a bigger conversation. I, I, I assume it was discussed a little bit earlier today. So there is that. Um, it's unfortunate. Egypt did work, I think, pretty well for like, I don't know, two and a half years. I saw 2012 going into 2013. That was the golden age. For any of us who were spending time in Egypt during that period, that was incredible. If you value freedom and democracy and saying whatever you think. It is true that a lot of Egyptians don't value those things. Are they a majority? I don't think so. But among elites, they are very powerful. I mean, that's most of my family. They don't believe that Arabs should 
have democracy. That is actually, the, I'm sure many of you have family members of that sort. There's something wrong with Arabs. They basically have something akin to like, um, to what, like the Bernard Lewis slash Brett McGurk school of like Middle East policy making, if I can call it that. Um, so that is a problem. But I don't think that the coup in Egypt would have happened if it wasn't for decisions the Obama administration made in a specific period of, I don't know, six months or three weeks or even three days. There were key things that were done that encouraged CC to go ahead with the coup. We know about this, it's well documented. Um, so, you know, it could have turned out differently. We shouldn't look at what happened and say, well, it was a failure and it was inevitably going to be a failure. It could have been otherwise. There are counterfactual histories in which Tunisia could have still been a democracy and where Egypt could have still been a democracy. Um, I mean, Turkey is relatively more democratic than um, most of the Arab world. It wasn't one person, one vote, one time. It was, I don't know, there were six elections that were relatively free and competitive. That's a lot better than the, entire, the entirety of the Arab world, except for maybe Iraq and Lebanon as the two partial democracies in the Arab world that, are, that still survive to this day. There are two success stories, we should say, in the Arab world, Iraq and Lebanon. Relatively speaking, let's not forget that. Yeah, that's pretty Maybe one more response. Yeah. Pretty relative. Just one quick comment to yeah. add to that. I mean, to be very specific, what we were looking for in the case of Tunisia, the question year after year after year is why doesn't, why is there no mm. international investment in the economy? The, the experiment failed because the economy failed. The, fa the economy failed in multiple cases, but just speaking of, of Tunisia now, because there was no international investment in the economy. And be, without that, especially post-colonial government, you didn't have anything to fall back on. You needed external investment. When you have powerful actors putting the brakes on that external investment, or in, in the cases that we've been alluding to, uh, we won't name names, but we know who was involved, direct investment in the, the coups that overthrew the the democratically elected governments, th there was no hope, no possibility. Whether you're Islamist or not had absolutely nothing to do with it. Not okay, thank you so much. I would like you to join me in thanking our outstanding panelists for their remarks and their engagement. I believe there are some closing remarks, right, Tridwan? Okay, go ahead, maybe you could tell us who that is. So we have a...